Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Martin, someone I was very fortunate to come in contact with early in my uh, self-publishing days. Uh, I think 2012 is when you and I first started uh, connected, Eric, and it was a project called Guts and Gunships. I think that was the first one I think so. uh, with uh, Mark Garrison. And it was just one of those projects that has done extremely well. And, uh, and it just, I'll tell you, for an author to hear their book come to life uh, to the caliber of someone like Eric, uh, we're just extremely fortunate. And, and it just is amazing to hear. I, I personally listen to books. Um, I can tell you my dad, he can, he can read just fine, but he prefers audiobooks. A lot of people, when you, you get into an audiobook experience, it's much different than reading. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, Eric, I'll let you just tell a little bit more about uh, your, your background, how you got into it to start. I've got some questions and then we'll also open it up for questions from other folks as well. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and make this you. Okay, so I'll hand it over to you, Eric. Cool. Well, hey, everyone. Yes, I'm uh, Eric Jason Martin. And uh, yeah, I am an audiobook uh, narrator, um, director and producer by, uh, by trade. Um, although I started uh, early, you know, I started reading very young, um, started um, um, memorizing uh, audio routines. You know, I had some some Walt Disney, uh, uh, like uh, Ludwig von Drake was a, he, he did some comedy routines uh, on record on 45 when I was a kid and I would memorize those and parrot those back to people. Sometimes people enjoyed it. Sometimes they didn't. I had to figure out my, um, when it was appropriate. And when I did, I became a better performer. Uh, and then, um, so I was, I was an actor um, for, for years and then I became, um, worked in themed entertainment. So I was a Walt Disney Imagineer for several years and worked at Universal Studios for almost 20 years. Um, during that time, uh, and I was uh, producing live entertainment um, and was a casting director was the last thing I did there. Um, but during that time, um, I was also getting into live storytelling here. I live in Los Angeles. Um, there was a live storytelling scene going on. Was very early in podcasting. I started listening in 2005 and started my first podcast in 2006. Um, had a lot of success with with podcasts in the uh, early 2010s, and through there found audiobooks. Um, and I was bringing a lot of even early on, as I was uh, I was fortunate to have some early success in audiobooks. But even then, I was looking at bringing in a lot of these different influences and and excitement from the live storytelling community, from the improv comedy community um, of which I was a part um, and the podcasting world to create- Power on. What's that? MP3, oh. audio link mode. Uh, so essentially um, just bringing all of this together and um, I created a um, uh, multicast audiobook. So that was something that um, I, um, uh, was was really getting into uh, at the time. Um, we did um, one of my first big ones was with uh, John Hamm. We we created a basically a '70s trucker movie uh, that didn't exist called uh, Stinker Let's Loose, and it was a uh, sort of a combination of uh, Any Which Way But Loose and S Smokey and the Bandit. But um, we made basically made an audio movie with John and Ray Seahorn from Better Call Saul, and got this great group of people together to um, tell tell a crazy story in, in audio and performed a live show in San Francisco. Um, from there, I worked with uh, Kate McKinnon and her sister, Emily Lynn, on a show called Heads Will Roll, um, which was a musical comedy series that premiered in Audible. Um, and, um, you know, a few other projects here and there. And then it led to the uh, the creation of my first uh, book as an author, which was something I wanted to do and which, which just came out last week. Cool. Well, so, and I didn't know that you had been in entertainment for so long. So you kind of had I, I'd say you probably weren't accustomed to a regular paycheck anyway. Were you sort of gigging it early in your career, throughout your career? Well, no, the idea was, is it actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I was working full time at, at Disney and, and Universal. And that's because, you know, I, I loved being an actor, but I was like, I hate auditioning. And, uh, you know, I want this, I want the steadiness because I, that's the way I, I grow best. So I figured out early on, you know, where to get into sort of technical positions or behind the scenes or producing to have a way to maintain a steady income. And that could be the base from which I could build it. So I worked you know, at Universal perhaps longer than I should have, but the idea was to create a base to, um, to have a, a steady, a stable income until I could um, feel confident enough to do this full time. Sweet. Um, and so that's kind of my, one of my questions was sort of how did you get good at it? 
like, but you were coming from an acting background. So you already had, like, you knew how to use your voice to tell a story and dive into characters. Yeah, I had a lot of things, um, you know, I had a lot of advantages going in, but it was still a pretty steep, you know, learning curve. And I would say over, you know, I was fortunate that some of the things I did right early on, but um, I had a lot of, of lessons to learn over time. It really does take a long time to figure out how to how to do this right. Um, and there's a lot of coaching and working and listening. You have to be a, a good listener and, and sort of benchmark what other people are doing. So, you know, it was through all those things <clears throat> that I slowly got better. You know, I think Ira Glass uh, hosted This American Life has a, has a thing that, you know, he started off as a public radio reporter when he was 18. And for the first 10 years, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was slowly finding his own individual voice. And so it was through doing um, and sometimes failing, but those failures were always instructive um, that I eventually began to carve out, you know, sort of my own storytelling voice, but, but it was a process. Well, you've done a lot of work. I mean, you've cranked out. It's amazing the number of books that you've completed. I mean, you've never stopped working since I met you, right? You've just been going at it. You never really throttled back. And if anything, you probably shifted into a higher gear. Would you say you're working harder today now than you were 10 years ago? In in some sense. I mean, it's it's great not to have a day job. Um, and yeah, the the sort of what I feel now is that I'm I'm actually slowing down a little bit i.e. to enjoy weekends and to actually take some some personal time. So in some sense, it's it's just as busy as it ever was, but I'm getting better about sort of pacing myself because I was probably going at burnout level for a while, because you certainly can. I mean, there's enough words out there that you can just keep saying the words until, um, you know, the words are going to win. You're not going to, you're not going to read all the words first. The, the words <laughs> and you're in win. demand. So you've got more projects than you can possibly do, right? It, it's it's true. It's fortunate to be to be able to to do that and, and juggle things. Essentially, I've got work booked out for the next few months, which is um, you know a bit of a relief. That wasn't always the case, but uh, but these days, yeah. So of the two hundred plus books that you've done, and I saw Menendez Murders, Beyond mm -hmm. Cruel, you've done some pretty intense tight stories. Are there any that have really stuck with you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got a a voice that you know can can I do a lot of different genres, but yeah, true crime is one that um, you know it it lends itself, and I'm you know I'm interested in that. So does it you give know, you nightmares though? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, you know, I can I can kind of put it away. I mean, it's all you know disturbing you know stuff, but um, you know, thankfully, I can put it down at the end of the day and you know think about other things. Although you know this stuff does kind of stay with you a little bit, so you got to be careful about it. Um, I always try to mix it up so that I'm not doing too much of any one genre because, you know, you do a few downer books in a row and, you know, even if you're resilient, it, it'll have an effect on you. So I try to- Well, and that's good because I showed the crew your, uh, our, your trailer for New Arcadia. And I think that that sort of is a fun project that you were able to probably have a lot more fun doing. And tell us a little bit about that. So how did that come to be? And did you always have a, a large cast and big full production in mind for it? Yeah, well, initially, this um, there was a very different and very early version of this um, that we were developing with with Audible. And I think the idea was to, um, you know, because I was fascinated. I, you know, I love video games and I love sort of that retro thing, having grown up, you know, as a child of the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, I, I just loved that world. And this genre, this sort of lit RPG or game lit, they call it, has become in incredibly popular. It's one of, you know, it's a huge selling genre. These these listeners or readers, they just, you know, they start one, you know, they, they rip through it, they start the next one, um, much like playing games. So, um, and I narrate a lot in this genre, so I, I knew I wanted to do something with it. So, um, we were initially thinking, let's set a world in, you know, set a world in the 90s um, and, you know, you know, in sort of this urban city that goes back to the, the style of, of game that this, um, this, this book is doing. Um, that fell through and I'm glad it did because essentially what happened was we went into lockdown last March um, and I began to conceive of this as a place for, you know, this, this sort of virtual city um, as a place where we can't go anywhere, you know, if we're doing it right, we, we can't go very many places. Uh, so, you know, what if we can go there virtually and then figure out a way for people to come together and, and be in a, in a community in this way. So that was the impetus for the, for the book. 
Um, and I started writing it. Um, it was very quick. You know, I started writing it over the summer and then here we are today. Wow. So is, was it inspired by Ready Player One? I mean, I was a huge fan of that audio book. The movie left a lot to be desired, but the yeah. audio book that I listened to was amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, not only did it inspire this, but it inspired, I would say that, you know, Ready Player One inspired that whole genre of game lit, lit RPG. So, you know, what this shares with that book are, you know, the idea of, you know, a virtual world and to some degree nostalgia. Although I made sure to that we do it much differently and that we have something unique to say. So it's different enough that, you know, we're not just ripping it off, but it's similar enough that if you like that, you're probably going to like this one. So that was done consciously. So a cast of 19. So essentially you were more than just the author. You were like a director of all of these people. How does it even, how do you even go about pulling together a book, an audiobook of night uh, with a cast of 19? Yeah. I mean, I've done, many more so this felt like a breeze um okay <laughs> in comparison but um you know and and it also helped to have people in mind when writing the book because i was imagining it's scary to write a book um but i had done many audiobooks so i was thinking of this as an audiobook um and that made it easier for me to imagine and also gave me a place of confidence. I was operating from a position of strength. So I was imagining all of these wonderful actors that I've worked with in the past or know, um, and uh, imagining them in the roles. And then it was easy for them, for me to say, hey, I wrote this part. I wrote a book. I wrote you in the book. Do you want to do this? Um, and that's a powerful thing. People will say, yes, they're flattered. <laughs> um, you know, especially if you create a, a good environment that, you know, people want to work in. And in this case, it was easy for them to say yes because they could record at home and um, we were keeping it, you know, light, like, you know, it was not a heavy haul for anybody. I think the most anybody worked was a single three hour session. I was the narrator, so I had the, the bulk of the heavy lifting, but we seamlessly integrated this cast of 19 into all the dialogue and in some cases, narration of their own. And did you have to then be the audio producer since there were so many fragments of this that you sort of knew had to pull together? Yeah, I was sort of the the ringmaster. So I was wearing a lot of hats and switching them off, but I made sure to hire a great team. So, um, you know, where the parts that I didn't want to do or the parts that I knew I could give to experts. So certainly the music. So we had two incredible artists, you know, one of my favorite artists of all time, Lloyd Cole, um, you know, who, you know, whose music originally was from the 80s, the 90s, and is now doing, you know, incredible work electronically today. We had him do the theme. We created a, an original chiptune soundtrack with Casey Trela, another great artist. Um, and then all these actors, you know, it was just, and then of course the, the post-production side. So we had people editing, proofing, listening, and, you know, stitching this all together. Um, so I just had to proof and listen to it. And, um, um, you know, just, uh, I was working with, with a great team and I couldn't have done it without them. So as a ballpark, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but what is a budget like? What, what do you even budget for a project like this? Yeah, well, it it varies. You know, I think for this, I've certainly done projects that were a lot more expensive, but here I wanted to, you know, essentially get the most bang for my buck. So I thought about, you know, what it would cost for people to, um, you know, to get them, you know, how, do, how did I want to structure this? Um, so I was very careful and deliberate and it helped to have done a number of them. So I, I had a good sense of what it would take. Um, you know, I, I think if I had done this earlier in my career, I, you know, probably wouldn't have nailed it just right. Um, but in this one, we worked fast and we did it pretty cheaply considered, you know, at no studio would have been able to, um, you know, do this for, you know, even a, a, you know, this was, this was a fraction of what it would cost to, if we had made it at Audible, for example. But right. uh, that's because I knew what to do. But you are the publisher. You didn't go with any major mainstream publisher, right? In this case, no. And 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 the you know, and I studied this carefully. The the genre, is, in most cases, is self published, is indie, um, and mm. um, you know, and I knew that um, you know it was high risk. Well, not terribly high risk, but you know, high enough risk. But there would be a, a very good reward, and I figured that it would, with the the talent that I had and the audiences that they bring. I knew that they would show up so that this would at least, you know, break even and it could do uh, very well. So, so that was the calculus that went into, um, 
you know, thinking about how to structure this. All right, and I have one more question, then I'll open it up to others. Um, but I'm really curious, how do you determine whether or not you're gonna do a project on a work for hire basis where they pay you upfront versus I'm gonna do this as a royalty share, meaning I'm gonna get royalties perpetually for the you know, life of the book, which means your hourly could go up or you know, it could be a, a crash and burn where you, know, you don't see much of anything back. Sure. How, what, what's the thought process? I mean, you go through, and what what do you recommend? Yeah, so I can I can quickly sort of walk everybody through the landscape of this, and basically for audiobooks, you know, publishers, most publishers, you know, like the big five and other associated audio publishers, will pay you an hourly rate, and it's a good rate, and um, you know, it is a SAG after covered thing, so they're paying into your health and and pension, so you can make a good. Uh, you can make a very good living as an actor if you work consistently. You know, it 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 becomes like um, you know a steady gig. Um, now there are times where, and there's something called ACX, which Audible has set up as an audiobook creation exchange, where essentially authors can go on and they can audition people. Um, you know, people can meet to sort of you know get their their audiobooks made without using a traditional publisher. Um, and the author or rights holder can pay the narrator slash producer, um, you know, an hourly rate, or they can do what's called a royalty share, which is they share in the profits of, you know, however many it's sold. And I've had some that have been huge hits, you know, that continue to, you know, pay many times over what I would have gotten, you know, in a per finished hour basis. Um, in some cases, that's evened out by the fact that the book is a turkey. Um, you know, and in those cases, then I'm, you know, I'm eating, you know, whatever time I put in and, you know, let's say a nominal fee for, you know, putting together the post-production. So it is a bit of a, a roll of the dice. Early, it was about getting, you know, as many, many credits or let's say I wanted to work in a certain genre. So I did a couple of thrillers where they didn't sell very well, but I could point to publishers and say, hey, I wrote this, you know, I narrated this thriller and then they would start hiring me for thrillers. And so, you know, I may have, you know, eating a few hundred bucks here, but I'm making, you know, thousands on, you know, doing a series for this, this publisher. So it's about the long game in that sense. Um, like but, run for the money. I remember you did for John. I mean, that was a great book, but he just didn't have the marketing muscle. And that must've been an earlier thriller for you, right? That was my first one. And I, that's, that's why I took it. I was like, this probably isn't going to sell that well, but I don't care. Um, now I care a little more. So, um, so yeah, so now I'm, if I'm doing a royalty share project, and I still do, um, I'm evaluating to see what's the marketing behind it, how many people are, you know, reading this, how old is it? Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into, will this make its return? Will it do better? So, yeah, so these are all things, you know. But you don't have time to read the whole book before you say yes, I'm assuming, right? You know, I'm a skimmer uh, these days. I'm a skimmer. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I've, I've taken enough of time. For, I have more questions, but I do want to open it up to the crowd. Um, and I know that we've got at least one other audiobook narrator on the line. Um, oh, cool. My, my wife's friend, Margie. Eric, do you ever do audio uh, royalty share plus? You know, um, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, I haven't found um, the right project for that, but um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I'm glad they did it. Um, you know, essentially the the way I'd see using that is having the author or rights holder mitigate the risk by paying for the post-production cost. That would be the way that I would use it. Um, and then essentially you're just, um, what you're paying is your time and talent. Um, that's what you're risking. So I like that as a, as a, as a strategy. And I, I agree that that's a good model because right now in the publishing world, especially on ACX, is there's way more authors looking for narrators than narrators looking for authors. And so in order to get a decent narrator, not somebody who's just starting out, you have to give them something. So to give them some financial carrot to say, all right, you know, we'll throw a few thousand dollars or whatever towards, towards this project. We know you're worth it, but we don't have to pay the full fare. Um, I think that's a, a great kind of compromise. Agreed. Anyone else got any questions? We didn't get into the technology too much. Eric, I know that, you know, this is the tech tech group. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about the tools and kind of what I know about Audible is they have very strict 
spec requirements. You can't just record yourself into a microphone and expect to upload files and have it all work out. So you have to kind of know what you're doing. That's true. Where I am right now, this is not where I record my, my audiobooks. Um, I actually have a home studio. It is a booth that I step into, close the door. Um, there's a computer inside and a microphone and there's padding and it's all, you know, specifically treated for that, that sound. Um, now, you don't have to, you know, if you're interested in doing this or perhaps, you know, narrating your own book, if you have one, um, you don't need to break the bank to do it. And in fact, I got far, perhaps farther than I should have, you sitting in my closet, you know, with a, you know, a certain sound, you know, treatment and, um, you know, a USB mic, which was pretty good. Um, so you can do it. Um, so yeah, but the truth is, you've got to know what you're doing and, and just have the sound you know, sound is so much better these days and it's it's easier to get, but you, you still have to record it right um, to do it. And what's so, the software you started using and do you, you still use it today? I, I started with GarageBand um, and we still use GarageBand when we're, when we're recording celebrities in their closets. Um, for, for people who don't have home studios, it's just easy to just, you know, press record and let it sit there. Um, now I use Pro Tools. You know, it's a bit much for, for what I'm doing, but um, but it works great. Um, yeah. You're not using that free program that I know was popular a while back. Uh, what's it called? Audacity. 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 Yeah. yeah, people use that. I And I have used that. Um, that's good for commercial records and things. And some people use it for audiobooks. It, it works fine. Hmm. Hey, Eric, I have a question for you. You talked a little bit about skimming a book. Um, yeah. but when you're doing character work, how much do you meet with the author or get some sort of brief on all of the characters so that you can go into it making character decisions versus finding out on the fly, oh, I've got to uh, read this, this lady and she's old and whatever. Totally. That's a great question. And, you know, and I'll say when I said skimming, that's if I'm, I'll only skim if I'm deciding whether or not I'm going to take on a project. Um, but if it's a, a book of, of fiction, then I'm reading it before before I start. And it's precisely because of that reason. You know, the the standard story is like, you know, you get to the end of the book and you find out that, you know, this person says in a thick Irish accent and, you you know, you've recorded the book. What do you do? That's why you read the book in advance. And I'll tell you, for, for me, uh, a real life example that I had, even though I... I Oh yeah, this because it was during my prep, and this is why you prep. They call it prepping. Um, so you know, I was reading this book. They gave me the, this like zombie, you know, fiction, and this you know badass sheriff, um, you know, is like protecting the the town. And then you know, maybe twenty pages from the end, um, you know, has a very neutral sounding name, but then she and it's all first person, so it's like I'm this character, and then this this sheriff reveals that um, they're pregnant. So um, I was like, hey, uh, guys, <laughs> you, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> so that's why you read. Yeah. And my dad actually did have a question because he's just a voracious listener. I mean, he just consumes audiobooks. I think he said he has over a thousand in his like account that he's listened to over the years. Right. Cool. Um, but he said, how in the world do you keep all the dialects separate for all the characters as you're going through the book? Like, He's amazed because you don't just read it straight through. You do play the character up with a particular voice and dialect, right? How in the world do you actually keep that all straight? Yeah, it depends on the parts. For nonfiction, you generally wouldn't do that. But yeah, for stories, for fiction, yeah. Um, and it also depends on the project too of how much you want to do and what's appropriate and how much you want to lean into the character voices. So there's there's so many decisions to make and truly every book is, is different and the way I approached it is different. But um, it's and it's different for for narrators. You know, some people will hide. They'll go through and they'll highlight the text, and every character will be a different color, and they'll have voice match samples and um, you know just all these these ways to to do it. For me, you know, I've I've got I've I've exercised the muscle enough that you know I can see the um, the name coming up as I'm scanning ahead. And just know, oh, okay, this next line is going to be in this voice. Um, and I know these characters as, you know, I think of them as as people. So it's easy, you know, for me to to switch from from voice to voice. Um, some people, it's it's more difficult and they need more preparation. But, you know, it's fortunate, which is probably why audiobooks are a, a good fit for me. You know, I'm a ham and I like to play every role wherever I can. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Of the um, of the 200 plus books that you've done, besides your own New Arcadia, which I recommend people check out, what what book would you say people that has like really <laughs> struck you? I mean, you've done so many books, but would you say there's one or two titles that you're just you were like blown away by the time you finished the project and you're like, this, this book is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I would say, you know, if I had to say one in terms of directing and producing, um, it would be heads will roll. It's Kate McKinnon. It's half the cast of SNL. We got Meryl Streep in there. It's, it's insane. It's just a crazy cast and it's so much fun and, and a good time. And then in terms of narration, um, you know, I've had a, a lot of good ones, but I, I'm going to go back to the, the beginning, you know, the one that, that started it for me. I did a, a book called uh, Detroit, an American Autopsy that came out a few years ago by an incredible author named uh, Charlie Leduff. Um, and sort of an ele- elegiac, uh, elegiac uh, you know, look into his, his hometown and um, gritty and, and, um, and yet hopeful. Um, and, uh, and that book opened a lot of doors for me. And, um, and I can go back and listen to it now and say, yeah, yeah, that's that holds up. So, um, yeah, those two. Very cool. Eric, can I ask, how long did it take you to do this last project with that number of people? And did you assemble all the files and send them to one production house to put together? Or did you do it? Or um, and, and do you mind if I ask who may have been, you know, some of the people that you um, utilized to put it all together? I, did, I mean, did you use Penguin House, or did you use Bright Side Audio, you know, Fireside, or who was it? I was just curious. Yeah, well, this was, uh, yeah, this was a fast process um, from my first email to a performer to the time we um, sent off the finished files to Audible. It was three months. Um, wow. So, you know, I was, I was, um, I started by narrating and then used that as the baseline, <clears throat> sent it off to our partners. Um, <clears throat> they're called Mumble Media. And these were people who worked at um, Audible, and so they had um, put together a number of Audible originals, and now they were striking, and, and including a few of the ones that I had done. So I was re-teaming with them, so I knew their style, they knew mine. So that was helpful to have a shorthand, uh, and they do great work. They're, they're incredible. Um, so it was, you know, doing my narration and then getting on Zoom and directing all the individual performers with their lines. Um, it wasn't just like animation where it's, you know, one line at a time, we would perform them as scenes whenever we could, because it helps, you know, good actors can figure out how to respond to something that isn't there, but I'm here. So, you know, let's, let's make it easy for them. They can focus on other things. So we did them as scenes and then they, uh, added them all together. We added the music, you know, trimmed here and there. And and that was the process. Do you prefer doing single narration or group narrations like that? both <laughs> I, I think i would get bored <laughs> with what with just one um i truly enjoy being able to to skip back and forth between genres and, and styles of working and i do dual narration um you know as well a lot of yeah. you know, a lot of books are, are dual narration and and that's a fun way to collaborate with someone that makes you feel you know not so alone and you can you know commiserate with somebody over the the writing and um and you know how you want to approach the characters um, and then the big multicasts are just are just a blast I think they're coming more popular than what they used to be. You didn't used to see the multicast so much as you do now. I think there's it's it's becoming more popular. And the music you never used to have a lot of music in audiobooks, but um, I uh, I find it very interesting for those people who are just starting out, including myself. Even though I've been doing it for a little while, it's still I'm pretty I'm still a novice at it. Um, using ACX at this point, even though you've got you know, a profile up on Fireside or Ahab or whatever the other things, and you don't get much projects from them when you're still so young and in your career and stuff like that. Do you have any um, suggestions as to how to try to get more work yeah. other than ACX? Yeah, I mean, ACX is difficult. ACX can be difficult. You can still use it to your advantage, um, like I said, and like, you know, using it as a way to essentially by creating projects, you can have, you can create calling cards. Um, and that will be a reliable way to do, to get work, you know, even though you're creating it, um, but, and you can make a return from it. But the other part of that is to, um, um, yeah, is to approach these, these publishers and, you know, have a, oh, and coaching. Well, that's the other thing too, right. is that, um, and that's how you get 
involved because this is a great here's the thing about you know if you listen to audiobooks um this is in many cases a community of people we all get together we enjoy each other's company we're nice people because we read a lot um and it's just a great group of, of people so um and we're a welcoming group because there are so many words to read so you know there's there's plenty of, of stuff to go around um so by you know going to events and and by you know taking coaching you 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 get better and then you become you know more a part of the community so that's the way it's set up all right thank you yeah that was one of my last questions what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you started and that probably helped marty too yeah i mean you know a lot of a lot of what i'm doing now um didn't exist you know at, at the time so we've we've collectively you know, created that I, I I would say, and I'm you know feel fortunate to have a small part in in helping to innovate this. But you know, back then, I think I was really chasing. You know, there was the prevailing model of that one narrator thing, um, and I was really going after that. Um, you know, wanting to be among you know those those people, and you know, and I've had success as a as a single narrator, very much so. But um, I would have told myself to um, that all the things that made me unique and all the things that I brought from different areas and that energy I was bringing that uh, just lean into that even harder. And, um, and um, yeah, I would have, um, I would have told myself that, um, you know, the change is, is coming and, and you're on the right track. Don't, uh, yeah, well, and don't you not listen to yourself. That question I even asked is kind of silly because you've been extremely successful in the field. So to ask that question, what would you have done differently? Well, you did what you did to be where you're at. Where else do you want to be? I mean, it's a silly question. So yeah. anyway, well, thanks for sharing. There's, True, there was some I mean, good insight. <laughs> totally. And I'm happy to be where, where I am, um, you know, today. This was, uh, this was a very unique uh, journey. <laughs> All right. Just do we have a few time for one or two more questions? I have, you guys? I have, I have one question. Please. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, when you are working on a fiction project and working effectively on your own as the narrator, as well as multiple characters. Do you go through the uh, book or manuscript chronologically start to finish or do you skip around and then put it all in the correct order in post-production? Oh yeah, you know, in a couple of cases, almost always chronologically, it's just so much easier. There was a time once where um, I was learning an accent because um, sometimes you have to do you know, accents and books. And there's some that I know very well um, and, you know, feel, feel good about. And I think there was, I think this one was Scottish and um, I'm just, I just wasn't, you know, I never grew up on it. I just didn't have it. Um, so I, I took a, I went to a dialect coach and we literally did the lines one by one. Uh, and then I inserted those in <laughs> into the book. So, but generally speaking, you know, you got to move fast. So I'm preparing, you know, chronologically, and then I'm almost always recording the book uh, if it's a single narration chronologically, unless there's a compelling reason not to do it. Hang on, I got a question here from Jeff Buckingham. Uh, is there work for anyone producing animal sounds for audiobooks, roosters, cows, et cetera? Special that's effects. A Jeff, that's a Jeff question. <laughs> you know, that's a great question. <laughs> I will say, uh, I will say an, an anecdote first. Um, I was, uh, when we were doing Stinker Let's Loose, um, we needed to find um, a way to get um, uh, ape noises, you know, or like chimpanzee noises. And uh, we found somebody who um, was able to do an incredibly convincing chimpanzee uh, voice. So uh, that was a great payday for her. Um, <laughs> so the one it, project she was born for. Yeah, I was. Mean, she's flexible. She could do a lot of stuff, but uh, but she was finally using her, her chimp skills. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there more and more. You know, certainly for for any radio, audio drama, um, you know, effects work um, fully. Uh, there are productions that that record in the actual spaces and you know, do it like like fully, um, and you know, create it like a Hollywood production. So. Um, if it's needed in the movies, you know, unless, you know, sound wise, then um, increasingly, you know, audiobooks are, are looking for that too. Yeah. And if you guys get a chance, you can look up Paul Carazzi. He's a client of mine as well, but he's a Hollywood director from the, uh, he was doing low budget movies back in the 80s. And 
he moved into audiobooks simply because I think he could get the funding for an audiobook, but he couldn't get the funding for, you know, full length feature films. But his audiobooks are huge productions, sound effects, multi characters. I mean, just it's so exciting to listen to. But I think he was either before his time or just it's hard to monetize that the way you monetize movies. Um, I mean, it's just the, the margins are so small. And sadly, Audible takes a huge chunk out of takes a percent, the, the, the lion's share of the sale, every time you buy an audiobook on uh, Audible, it's sadly, most of it's going to Amazon. <laughs> yeah, But they, they, got, they own it, they built the industry, I mean, that in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, that's how they got where they were, I get it. Got another question here from Ke Kenny O'Reilly. I don't know why you guys don't just speak up. <laughs> is there a real market for original background and theme songs? How would an artist learn about this opportunity if there is a market? So how did you find your musicians, Eric? Uh, I'd worked with Casey before we had done an improvised audiobook, which is not an easy thing to do, but we, we tried it. It was, a, it was a fun experiment. And so I found him through that. And, and then, then for Lloyd Cole, I was just a huge fan of his, um, you know, and I think he was excited both by the project and also by the fact that like, oh, you know, I, I want to do more of these. So um, I think it's not really a thing yet because, you know, in many cases, it doesn't necessarily buy you. Anything. You can't charge more for it, sadly, right? <laughs> yeah, but there are some productions where it does make sense. So I'd say increasingly, you know, we've seen music themes, um, you know, and we use music in really effective ways. We, we didn't do much in sound in terms of sound effects, but we used music in, in really effective ways to tell the story here. So I think more and more audio, it's, it's already happening, but more and more will do it. It will be some percentage of the market. Yeah, and I guess the thing about music too is it's somewhat of a personal preference. I personally like background music when I'm listening, like soundtracks, but I've also talked to people who hate that. Like they don't want to hear anything but the speaking of the book. So you're sort of towing a little bit of a preference, you know, it's personal preference line there. The best thing would be in the future if Audible allows you to basically turn music on and off, you know, to give you that ability, um, which I'm sure someday they will. So any final words? And by the way, we can stay on. I just promised Eric that I would limit it to 30 minutes and we've already gone over. Okay. Eric, is there anything else you want to share? Maybe last minute plugs? Yeah, I mean, just New Arcadia stage one. It's out. It's, it's you know, we've just had our first week. Um, we're, we're on the main page of, uh, of Audible. I'm next to Stephen King. I never thought I would see that. Wow. Um, we're going to be, um, you know, uh, there's going to be some other, things coming out so it, it's it's just been a, a thrilling time and and people have been enjoying that's the scary thing about an author you know you create something and uh you just don't know what how it's going to be received. received it's all yeah. it's all in your head it's all in, and then it's on the paper but then now seeing it out and and seeing people responding to this and loving it has been so gratifying so um if you have any interest in it you know it's out there it's, it's pretty cool well, I loved Ready Player One, so I'm ready. I'm going to definitely listen to it next on my uh, on my queue. I'll put it in my queue and listen to it. It's not very long either, right? It's a relatively short book. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's around just a little over ten hours. So we we try oh. to find this the sweet spot for it. For some people, that's short, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it depends. All right, well, we'll we'll stay on, you guys. Uh, you don't all need to drop off, but Eric, we'll let you go, and I will stop recording now. But I really, really appreciate it. And uh, again, it's just a a blessing to know you and the projects that you and I have worked on together. I'm so grateful to you. So thank you. A true pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate thank it. You so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.